Hello and welcome to Symbolholic. <laughs> it's my new channel. My rebranding. Uh, this presentation is going to be roughly an hour long. I know that because I just did it. And uh, the audio came through one speaker instead of both of them. So I went ahead and put my OBS on mono and we're going to try this again. So this is going to, like the title suggests, be a brief overview of... Um, alchemy basically the seven hermetic principles and um basically discussing the kabbalion which is a very controversial book because some people hate it some people love it it resonates with me and i'm going to use it as sort of a base to branch out to other things and to relate them back to the kabbalion so we're going to get right into it here the return home man's search for external meaning leads him back to the mystic center of the all fundamentals of the seven hermetic principles or world religion this presentation will illuminate one to the power held within alchemy being the art of transformation or transmutation alchemy is one of the most important studies known to man it really is. It unifies science, philosophy, religion into a cohesive whole. The Kabbalion by Three Initiates is a recitement of the seven hermetic principles of Hermes Trismegistus, the master of all masters, a mystic who resided in Egypt and was deified into the god of Esoterica, Thoth, by Egyptians. And it's controversial whether he was a real figure. Most people don't think that he was a real figure. He was just, you know, a representation through antiquity of um, basically the occult sciences. And whenever somebody wrote from the perspective of God or the all, they would attribute it to Hermes. And you get a lot of like the Hermetica being official, but not from a real figure. So if you want to know a little bit more in the etymology of the Kabbalah, you can check out the modern Hermeticist. He's an actual scholar. And he studies all the actual hermetic, um, which, you know, is a lot of different religions and stuff in there too, and philosophies, which exist in hermetic philosophy. So go check out him. He'll give you the rundown on the official business. The Kabbalion credits Egypt to be the birthplace of the hidden wisdom and mystic teachings that has majorly influenced the philosophies of all nations, including India, Persia, Chaldea, Medea, China, Japan, Assyria, ancient Greece, and Rome, and other ancient countries. These Egyptian adepts have never been surpassed or equaled by any to precede them, which this is kind of the lore of the Kabbalion being Egyptian. But um, if you guys want to check out some more... On this topic definitely check out the secret teachings of all ages by manly p hall um there has been other mystery schools predating the egyptian um schools and stuff so but we're gonna go with this okay because this is the kabbalion and it's badass um, the Hermetists were the original alchemists, astrologers, and psychologists, Hermes being the founder of these schools of thought. From astrology has grown modern astronomy. From alchemy has grown modern chemistry. From the mystic psychology has grown the modern psychology of the schools. Um, the Kabbalion. Hieroglyphs and scrolls show Egypt had a full understanding of astronomy, chemistry, and a more advanced understanding of psychology called mystic psychology, which modern times are just catching up with. Which this is kind of what this presentation is going to be about. It's about the mental transmutation. Hermetists encode their teachings in astrology and symbology for this very reason. The mystical power held within the hermetic principles holds the key to the universe. These truths or natural laws were generally only taught orally to whom the hermetists deemed capable of wielding the master key or elixir of life. Because if it were to fall into the wrong hands, there'd be empowered, evil individuals that may, um, you know, wield this power in the wrong way. This is something I made up here, the dropship effect. Initially, man feels alien to a foreign land because of his spiritual nature and higher cognitive functions in contrast with this primal lower evolved form of the natural world so the level of halo there where you land on an alien planet 
that's how we feel, you know. We feel separate from this place that we call Earth or Gaia. Um, hermetic alchemy is based off of natural law. This is likened to the universe and man reaching out to achieve a common rhythm for the mutual benefit of both. I love that. Um, nothing is constant but change. Hermetists observe cycles in nature and thought and try to arrive at a constant reality. Hermetists and mystics don't rise above nature, but simply use one law against another, or one principle against another. Their success is dependent upon their awakening to the law of love or positive vibration. Here we see Mama Earth and uh, the Tree of Life with the cycles of death and rebirth going around here in alchemy. Um, first hermetic principle, mentalism. This is the main one. <laughs> this is like the end all be all to all the hermetic principles and they put it first, which it is fundamental. Um, in a dictionary of symbols, J, which is behind me, very amazing book. Go pick it up. Very amazing. Um, J.E. Surlot highlights Carl Jung's findings on the nature of consciousness, a common spiritual tale that has been narrated by all of man throughout the dawn of time. This is the story of the inner spark, collective unconscious, or the all. So you could check out the um, Arcana too, like the 22 Arcana. This is kind of going into the, the secret teachings, you know. The Gnosis. The first hermetic principle of the all is mind, echoed by Carl Jung, stating that the subjective creates the objective. So our psyche creates our physical reality and our um, environment. The universe that is existing in the mind of the all, the Kabbalion. The all can be, pro can be conceptualized as planets being a mere atom in the brain of the all. Does that look like an eye to you in the galaxy? Is that cool? Also with the boom, the eye of Horus. I love that. The story of Christ is of a man that has returned to direct communion with creator consciousness. The man embodies this power of love to perform miracles on earth by way of channeling. This truth can only be explained through scientific accuracy. Natural law is just scientific observation that has progressed to understand unseen spiritual dimensions. Alchemy being the holy science aims to unify not only science and religion, but every concept possible in the mind of the all. Here we see the all-seeing eye, which is a tear in our dimension, which God is peeking through and the light's shining through. We're not, uh, we'll break down that symbol in future videos. The inner eye or all-seeing eye, the pineal gland, is adorned to represent philosophical thought, philosophy, the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. Here we can see Freemasonry symbol. We got the Hindu, the Brahmanistic. We got Buddhism. We got the Egyptians with the, you know, cobra coming out of the third eye representing the awakened and risen Kundalini. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thine whole body shall be full of light. Christ, Matthew 6.22 A protractor was placed on the third eye to create the halo. This represented the ability to tap into this universal reality, as well as represent that they aren't God, but that God is illuminating them and they're, they're a channel for God. All of the, um, the prophets, as well as Jesus, a mystic. The topmost sephirah on the tree of life, sephirah it should be, um, keter is the highest vibration or the all and is referred to by Kabbalists as the beginning of the whirlings. Once you realize you were the eye of the storm, you become gradually less affected and tossed around by flux. Also, hermaphroditic at that point, the all, because it hasn't yet switched into its masculine and feminine poles. The flower of life is represented at the first fundamental level of matter in the way of the nucleus. The atom is pure energy unfolding outwardly, at this stage consisting of rudimentary numbers, colors, and shapes, specifically circular. Energetically, this is the highest vibration of matter. And then once you move up from this, you know, you have little cells. Those are conscious. Those are doing their own thing. They're eating. 
and doing and they're sentient right so we got consciousness in in every form down to the uh, god particle in the nucleus which is nothing essentially and everything it's the all so the sun was greatly revered by humanity as a representation of the inner light because its energy comes from within itself the sun has no need for oxygen because it operates on th thermonuclear fusion instead of combustion thus not requiring an external source like oxygen so we get the son of god reference there right the unfolding of creation seen here represented in the rose in the center of the rosicrucian cross based on jewish kabbalah okay illustrating the void unfolding into the physical as well as in the Buddhist mandala or thousand petaled lotus representing pure consciousness emanating its reverberations into existence from a center of white, gradually becoming more complex and dense. This is the basis for magical thought because this creates the idea that creating mental thoughts changes the universe. Hermetists are able to walk freely along the psychic plane, the Kabbalion. And here we got the magician with all the tools here. At his disposal although he's not holding them get the ads above so below and pentacles representing earth the cups emotions swords intellect and the wands will um, synchronicities in art and philosophy this is kind of controversial okay this is Carl Jung's uh, look on it and it's a mystical kind of outlook on this synchronicities in art and philosophy occur because the subjective manifests the objective Symbols of creation, cycles of death and rebirth, and patterns of macro and microcosm, among others, emerge because these are emanations from the all within, expressing its inner and outer workings throughout the process of unfoldment. The idea is that the symbol incarnates and not in a physical aspect. They spread out from a spiritual center, a dictionary of symbols. Here we got the Chinese mythology art here, looking like DNA. It's kind of where, like, emanates out from and then the emanation from the all representing the fifth hermetic principle of rhythm here seen in the in the you know positive and negative flowing here from the waveform of this uh serpentine figure in this dragon so this is controversial because a lot of people think that the mystery schools just built on each other and gradually compounded information but when you look at the archetype of the universal unconscious you know it's it's obvious that you have the cradle of religions but if you go to a random little tribe they'll have uh, a story of the flood they'll have a story of god you know or of the son of god and, and stuff like that so it's clearly emanations from our uh, our universal universal unconscious so second hermetic principle correspondence here the grid that connects everything this is probably one of my favorite ones because it really just sums it all up a buddhist kwan illustrates this law with the following example a man who has never set eyes upon an ocean can make an accurate assumption of what it would look like by simply observing a thimble of water because water retains its same qualities no matter how much of it there is the patterns are holographic in nature so i will go I will break it down right now. Sure, sure, sure. So basically, a hologram, Mark Passio illustrates this very well. Like, if you take a hologram, right, of a human, and if you remove a leg from them, okay, what do you think is going to be left? You're going to have a hologram of a person with a missing leg and then a, a hologram of a leg? Nope. You'll have a three quarters the resolution image of the entire image of the first one and then you'll have a quarter resolution of the image in your the one that you removed from it you remove resolutions from it that's how a hologram works so if we look at the water that's clearly holographic in nature because it it works on that same principle of um we'll say um can't think of the word right now but it's like uh damn resolution we'll say so simulation a simulation is the imitation of a real world or system over time simulations require the use of models the models represent the key characteristics or behaviors of the selected system or process 
whereas a simulation represents the evolution of the model over time. Uh, Wikipedia, <laughs> okay, not the most, not the most reputable source, but whatever. Um, this perfectly corresponds with the all is mental f model of hermetics, with the like the tree of life, where like our physical reality is a reflection of the divine um, reality that exists. The tree of life is the energetic signature of the mind of the all. So when we look around here, these are correspondences, you know, they're not necessarily the energetic centers of us, like our chakras, but this is a, um, a key to understand how um, spirituality came into manifestation, we'll say. We'll go into the, uh, the tree of life in another video very soon. As above, so below. Consciousness projects itself through every level of the perceivable plane. Once these patterns and cycles are acknowledged as fractal in nature, it must be assumed they are echoed in all unperceivable realms as well. So, if you go on YouTube right now and if you search Mandelbrot equation, you'll see just an endless zooming in and it never stops because it works on the one same equation. Kind of like in a video game how... Um, procedural generation works on how you can just keep going and it'll just keep generating because it's working off the same equation, right? That's how our reality is. Um, one of Carl Jung's arrivals on the second hermetic principle is pointed out in a dictionary of symbols, illustrating that symbology proves the philosophy it holds within by means of observing a lower fidelity realm of reality, which is the symbol in the formative plane, sharing truths that exist on a much higher vibration than it, in this instance, the mental plane. Given that every symbol echoes throughout every plane of reality and the spiritual ambience of a person is essentially one of these relationships traditionally established by the micro and macrocosm, a relationship between philosophy and has verified man as the messenger of being Heidegger. Given this, then it follows that every symbol can be interpreted psychologically. It holds true to the collective nature of people. A Dictionary of Symbols, J.E. Surlot. A symbol is relative, however, and is subject to the observer projecting their own meaning, resulting in an endless possibility for interpretation. So the hermetists arranged correspondences of the three planes into a large matrix of overlapping truths stringing them along a common thread so each could hold its unique spot in the cosmos. Um, this thread was the cycle evident in the three planes owned by hermetists as vegetable and meteorological life, natural human life, spiritual growth, and finally fossilization and flux. This is the cycle of death and rebirth. And although the alchemists in uh, antiquity did a lot of this correspondence work overlapping all different sites of different types of cycles um, in recent times the order of the golden dawn hermetic order of the golden dawn was really influential in making so many correspondences from astrology overlapping on the tree of life overlapping on um, many mystery schools and many mythologies from antiquity so it's a lot it's a lot to learn and it's fun. Decomposing organic matter provides the most nutri nutritious soil for the growth in the plant kingdom. So the death and rebirth cycle is very evident in that in that illustration. We talk about that in Gnosis a lot, which is a great study to get into. Third hermetic principle, vibration. Uh, we see the caduceus here with both the channels of the male and feminine um, energetic pathways of the human body and of the psyche um, nothing rests everything moves everything vibrates the Kabbalion a commonly accepted fact in the modern scientific community and new discoveries seem to prove this the differences between different manifestations of matter energy mind and even spirit result result largely from varying rates of vibration from the all which is pure spirit down to the grossest form of matter all is in vibration so here we can see that you know the planets <laughs> and the, the moons orbiting them are very similar to an atom and its little nucleus is orbiting them 
And I threw this in here because this was cool with the pathways of the of the uh, electrons rather um, orbiting the like the nucleus. It looks like the Star of David in this picture. So I thought that was pretty sick. The higher the vibration, the higher the position on the scale. The vibration of spirit as at such is at such an infinite rate of intensity and rapidity that it is practically at rest just as a rapidly moving wheel seems to be motionless so this can be like you know in music how the scales go only so far and then there's another octave of the same scale and another octave so they're just octaves of one another but specifically what this is illustrating is that spirit is seems to be still but it's the highest form of vibration because just like a wheel it seems to be still when it's spinning so fast so here we got this little um fan thing that shows like a clock because the led seems to be not moving but um really it's in motion as well as this other little sign here that's like a similar um effect that appears to be motionless and at the other end of the scale there are gross forms of matter whose vibrations are so low as to seem at rest like a bollion so i put this in here too because look at this we got crystals that we think are just dense matter that are just n existing of nothing but really there's there's energy in crystals as well the illumined call it spirit the kabbalion spirit is simply a definition that men give to the highest conception of living mind it means the real essence it means the living mind kabbalion occultists look at spirit as living power There are lower elementals and higher spiritual entities on every possible subdivision of the seven heavens or vibratory planes above and below earth. We're not going to get into all of those in this lecture. But we will. To know oneself is to know the all because everything is living mind. So know thyself, Socrates. And uh, the Hindu concept of Brahma, the shared active divine awareness within all of creation. And not only do all sentient life have like an inner monad that is the essential nature of them, the spirit that they gradually manifest. Like in every little cell, in every little atom, there's the God particle. So every little minute part of um, creation is conscious, not only beings. Kabbalah meaning process of receiving or knowledge of self and uh, the tarot the pictorial of the universe or the book of life truth and the study of self so i threw some books in here cool books to pick up i haven't read these <laughs> i have read some of these though definitely got to pick up the secret teachings of all ages by manly paul if i didn't already mention this there's all sorts of um all sorts of great stuff here comparative religions philosophies and mainly the secret schools obviously oh my goodness freemasonry we got early early stuff like the orphic egg and the orphic traditions we got the we got everything uh, what other books you can pick up if you want to study the kabbalah in more depth the chicken kabbalah by lon milo duquette is great it's really in depth but like you've got the supernal triad here the trinity and then it reflects into us and man's soul and it really breaks down each of the pathways each of the sephra as well as at the end of the book i don't want to spoil it but there's um there's some good tarot um associations as well as uh in the four formative or the four worlds the four kabbalistic worlds um leading to some magic if you want to get into sigils and stuff and start working with like gematria it's all in here it's very cheap and you can find it on amazon it's worth a buy uh we got matter at a higher vibration is called the ethereal substance it pervades universal space and is said by hermetists to be a connecting link between matter and energy and also it raises a vibration entirely of its own the kabbalion with this is like ancient science you know but i believe this because i feel like this is where the universal unconscious comes from 
it's beyond it's out of our self i believe uh, light heat magnetism and electricity are but forms connected in some way with the probable or and probably emanating from the ether <laughs> probably that's funny it's essentially the akashic records <laughs> maybe not though guys that's my opinion okay but this is going to be pretty lengthy this is a large quote from the Kabbalion because it illustrates all of vibration in the spectrum of everything. Gradually how they feed into each other. It's pretty cool. So the energetic spectrum is illustrated by the observation of a wheel or top spinning gradually increasing its rate of vibration. Let us suppose the object moving slowly. It may be seen readily but no sound of the movement reaches the ear. The speed is gradually increased. In a few moments, its movement becomes so rapid that a deep growl or low note may be heard. Then as the rate increases, the note rises one in the musical scale. Then the motion still being further increased, the next highest note is distinguished. Then one after another, all of the notes of the musical scale appear rising higher and higher as the motion is increased. Finally, when the motions have reached a certain rate, the final note perceptible to the human ear is reached and the shrill, piercing shriek dies away and silence follows. No sound is heard from the revolving object and the rate of motion being so high, the human ear cannot register the vibrations. Then comes the perception of rising degrees in heat. Then after quite a time, the eye catches glimpse of the object becoming a dull, dark, reddish color. As the rate increases, the red becomes brighter then as the speed increases, the red melts into an orange, then the orange melts into a yellow, then follows successively the shades of blue, green, indigo, and finally violet as the rates of speed increase. Then the violet fades away and all color disappears, the human eye, does, uh, the human eye not being able to register them. But there are invisible rays emanating from the revolving object, the rays that are used in photographing, and other subtle rays of light then begin to manifest the peculiar rays known as the x-rays etc as the constitution of the object changes electricity and magnetism are emitted when the appropriate level of vibration is attained when the object reaches a certain rate of vibration its molecules disintegrate and resolve themselves um, into the original elements or atoms then the atoms following the principle of vibration are separated into the thousand corpuscles of uh, which they are composed. And finally, even the corpuscles disappear and the object is said to be composed of the ethereal substance. And then on spirit word until it finally, uh, until it would finally re-enter the all, which, in abs which is absolute spirit. The object would have, however, ceased to be an object long before the stage of ethereal substance which reached but otherwise the illustration is correct okay it continues here the light and heat at the early stages of energetic increase are not because the object is vibrating at those levels yet which is much later and would mean it would not be manifesting physically that is energy being liberated from its atomic confines um, these forms of energy and though much higher in scale than matter are imprisoned and confined in the material combinations by reason of the energies manifesting through and using material forms but thus becoming entangled and confined in their creation of material forms which to an extent is true of all creations the creating force becoming involved in its creation the Kabbalion and here I have a hologram, a three-dimensional image formed by the interference of light from a laser or other coherent light source, Oxford Dictionary. So basically, everything is a projector projecting outwardly because, and gradually, we get the physical um, reality because it's, it's everything becoming entangled with its own manifestation. But the hermetic teachings go much further than these of modern science. They teach that all manifestations of thought, emotion, will, or desire, or any mental state or condition are accompanied by vibrations, a portion of which are thrown off and tend to affect the minds of others, other persons by induction. This is the principle that goes on to produce the phenomenon of telepathy, mental influence, and other forms of powers of mind over matter. The Kabbalion. So basically, guys, 
a little form of magic there to influence people is if you like lower your or well we'll say if you match their vibration then you can gradually influence them by introducing your own thoughts to either lower their vibration or raise it which is a what they use in um uh all forms of therapy so every thought emotion or mental state has its corresponding rate and mode of vibration and by the effort of the will of the person or of other persons, these mental states can be reproduced just as a musical tone may be reproduced by causing an instrument to vibrate at a certain rate or color can be reproduced in the same way. By a knowledge of the principle of vibration as applied to mental phenomenon, one may polarize his mind at any degree he wishes, thus gaining a perfect control over his mental states, moods, etc. In the same way, or yeah, he may influence the minds of others achieving this desired state in them. He may be able to produce on the mental plane that which science produces on the physical plane, namely vibrations at will or transmutation. Fourth Hermetic Principle, Polarity. Everything has its pair of opposites. Like and unlike are the same. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Like we can see here that cold is just the absence of heat. Darkness is the absence of light. They're both the same thing. They're both light energy in that sense. Temperature, you know, cold and hot, they're both temperature, both the same thing. Different sides to the same coin paradox is a universal idea referenced notably in Zen philosophy by Shunryu Suzuki. And I actually got all the books on hand in the studio today. Look at this. We got Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, which that quote is from, the upcoming quote. And... Um, breaks down Zen philosophy. It's amazing. Very simple. Um, he uses the analogy to demonstrate the notion that the all can be nothing and everything at the same time. This idea is echoed in the Taoist philosophy by the notion that returning to the all is in fact to lose what we've learned instead of gain new external knowledge, therefore returning to our inner gnosis or knowing. Through this illustration, we can observe the relative nature of relativity. As a typo, oops. Um, how do I go back? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Oops. Um, I done screwed up. I done screwed this up, guys. Where are we at? Relativity. Um, if we take temperature, cold and hot are only things above and below where our perception lies at the time and is not a constant. If we have a base temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, 40 degrees will feel hotter to us and 34 degrees will feel cooler. If our body temperature decreases to 30 degrees Celsius, what was once cold to us is now 4 degrees hotter than our base temperature, making 34 degrees feel warmer. So it's all relative. Extremes meet. All truths are but half-truths and all paradoxes can be reconciled, which like I said in therapy, they use that a lot polarity so here in pol polarity here we got a magnetism diagram with the earth's magnetic field being an exact literal representation of our body's like energetic field there with the positive and negative poles looking like an apple Things belonging to different classes cannot be transmuted into each other, but things of the same class may be changed, that is, have their polarity changed. Thus, love never becomes east or west or red or violet, but it may and often does turn into hate. And likewise, uh, hate may be transformed into love by changing its polarity. Courage may be transmuted into fear and the reverse. Hard things may be rendered soft, dull things become sharp, hot things become cold, and so on the transmutation being on the same kind of different degrees. Polarity can be observed in the middle pillar 
and paths running through it demonstrating the possibilities for transmutation between opposite poles of vibration. So if we see here, we got like human Boaz in the middle pillar, we have the balance between both. Pharaoh holds twin opposites, shepherd staff, mercy, and flail severity in balance. Both are used to subdue animals. Here they symbolize mastery over man's animal nature. The shepherd staff is used to pull stray animals by the neck without hurting them, mercy. The flail is used to beat animals into submission, severity. Richard Cassaro, written in stone. That's another great um, website to check out, richardcassaro.com. Lots of hermetic uh, teachings. Here's a little thing I put together, like, the gentle horse rider signifies intent with the horse with as little friction as possible to equalize both rider and horse exercising an instinctive grasp of natural law. Because on the chariot card here, we see the two sphinxes um, pulling in opposite directions, but therefore creating equilibrium. And with the strength card, she is performing um, an act of subduing this lion by gently um, petting his snout. <laughs> she's not being aggressive with it, meaning that she's basically, um, you know, um, she's cooperating with natural law instead of trying to to just bend it to her will. The fifth hermetic principle of rhythm, everything flows out and in, everything has its tides, all things rise and fall, the pendulum swing manifests in everything, the measure of the swing to the right is the measure of the swing to the left, rhythm compensates, the Kabbalion. The principle manifests in the creation and destruction of worlds, in the rise and fall of nations, in the life history of all things, and finally, in the mental states of man. Beginning with the manifestations of spirit from the all, it will be noticed that there is ever the outpouring and the indrawing, outbreathing and inbreathing of the Brahm, as the Brahmins word it. The universes are created, reach their extreme low point of materiality, and then begin their upward swing. Suns spring into being, and then their height of power being reached, the power of uh, retrogression begins, and after aeons, they become dead masses of matter awaiting another impulse, which starts again their inner energies into activity, and a new solar life cycle is begun. This is with all the worlds and shapes and forms. They are born, grow, then die, then are reborn. Night follows day, and day night, the Kabbalion. Here we got the Ouroboros and the infinite Ouroboros, same concept. Carl Jung's classification of truth. Objective, nothing more than understanding. Subjective applies the widest, most profound meaning to a given subject. And psychological provides the middle way between the objective and subjective truth. The Hermetists developed a language of corresponding psychological truths based on rhythms and cycles of flux. Flux being the action or process of flowing and flowing out, Oxford Dictionary. Stagnancy is a construct of the finite mind. Everything is in a constant stage of flux with varying degrees. The higher the rate of energetic vibration, the faster the rate of birth and decay is. The lower the energetic vibration, the slower the rate of birth and decay is, making it more dense as it descends from its source. And our finite minds look at a rock like it's always going to be there but we know that you know that's going to be dust and everything is um, eroding and, and changing into uh, other forms so nothing is um, finite nothing can be created or destroyed um, Carl Jung's subjective and objective interpretation this law of polarity indicates that one's base consciousness must have its polar opposite if consciousness emanates from within outwardly in everything, that would mean that the conscious mind is just the unconscious mind ricocheting off of things and being interpreted by the father consciousness of which it came by way of the objective faculties. Through the principle of polarization, we can transmute these signals back to their original source. So basically, when we f receive things with our five senses, they need to be looked at a little deeper. 
law of compensation meaning to counterbalance. The master of hermetics polarize it, polarizes himself at the point to which he desires to rest and then neutralizes the rhythmic swing of the pendulum that would tend to carry him to the other side of the pole. The Kabbalion. The mastery of self-control relies on one's ability to focus on the most positive spectrum of whatever indesirable emotion one experiences until the emotion which is not desirable dissolves into its ad admirable counterpart, like fear into courage. Here we got the Earth's highest vibration existing at its core and human emotion heat signatures indicating that depression is low and happiness and love are the highest of heat vibrations. Hermetic philosophy and the modern the and modern theology differ on inflow and outflow. Mainstream religion would argue that the ego flows outwardly and the spirit flows inwardly when we know that spirit flows outwardly and the ego is just those reverberations of being uh, received by our, our five senses. So I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free, Michelangelo. This is the alchemical process of releasing impurities to reveal the inner beauty of the sculpture. There is a yogic process too which can be likened to spiritual deduction, which is to understand what one isn't to reveal what one is. One examines what one is left with after this process and accepts what he cannot change. This wisdom popularized in modern times by Indian mystic Sadhguru. Same concept as, the, as Michelangelo, but here we got this, this spirituality of it. So like, am I this hat? No. Am I my body? Not really. I'm a spirit. Um, directing my body so you start to understand what you are when through the process of deduction Joseph Campbell shows correspondences of re-emerging archetypes like the dragon in the world's mythologies which represent the collective unconscious triumphing over its egoic counterpart here we got St. George killing the dragon Horus slaying Set he's a little uh, <laughs> he's a little alligator but we're going to go with it monk killing dragon Okay, second millennium BC, the Babylonian serpentine deity monster Tiamat emerged from the sea to threaten all of creation with a return to primordial chaos. The heroic young god Marduk takes up the challenge, slaying Tiamat and rescuing the cosmos. The Leviathan appears in Psalm 7414 as a multi-headed sea serpent that is killed by God and given as food to the Hebrews in the wilderness. spiritual transmutation the higher divine nature which appears separate and unattainable becomes apparent to the ego when it meets this dual consciousness within and resonates at the same level as it thus totally transmuting the primitive ego mind into a higher state unifying the two as a sort of two-headed angel so we can never get rid of our ego it's there for a reason but we can we can raise it to um vibrate at the same level as our our other consciousness the universal unconscious this is a bold claim that man may reach the all consciousness but the all on the plane that we can perceive it closest the consciousness can be likened to the theme of ascension and growth to ever greater planes of harmony in the all this higher state of oneness constantly striving for intimacy with the all although realizing it is unknowable at the same time the spiritualist surrenders while a magician controls his divine will to transmute the world around him into the divine will of the all for the betterment of himself and others through wisdom of natural law. So we can see the dual headed angel there with a bunch of other astrological symbolism, male and female. We're not going to get into all that right now. Ease and perfection depend entirely upon the degree which we cease to depend on the conscious. Playing the piano, skating, Operating the typewriter, the skilled trades depend on their perfect execution of the process of the subconscious mind. We are all aware how dependent we are upon the subconscious, and the greater, the nobler, the more brilliant our thoughts are, the more it is obvious to ourselves that the origin lies beyond our kin. The master key system, Charles F. Hanel. Which, guys, check out the master key society 
on YouTube and you can find the Kabbalion. You can find this book, The Master Key System. You can find a book that's called, I think it's just called The Subconscious Mind. All the, all the audio books on there are unreal. Really worth the checkout. The subconscious sends signals to the conscious mind fractions of a second before the conscious mind has the illusion of free thought. Zen master Alan Watts points this out by the illustration of a stranger saying hello while crossing paths with you on a walk. Your reaction time is immediate and subconscious. You don't think then act. Both are done simultaneously. This is the flow state practiced by masters. James Allen in The Mastery of Destiny, which is another amazing book to check out w for free on YouTube, points out the physical observations um, of one that has mastered concentration or the art of self-control. The individual seems to be in a state of repose or relaxation, but also having tunnel vision or being locked in the zone. The man is not straining, like the center of a top where it is the highest concentration of energy or in, its, um, in this example of mind, the highest energy of concentration not being affected by outward stimuli. And that was supposed to be the center of a top. Or yeah, that's what it said. Um, the neurota is perceivable through the relaxed yet erect posture of the meditator. Seen here, so it's kind of focused, but it's in repose at the same time. Um, Patanjali's heart mind is achieved when or is achieved which means to unify action emotion and feeling into a single flow state occurring simultaneously our field of consciousness has absorbed whatever it is focused on that we cannot perceive any difference between the two path of the yoga sutras another unreal book that is like comparative religions there's all different quotes from the bible as well as um buddhism and just everything in that um o sacred heart of jesus Li a living and quickening source of eternal life, infinite measure of the divinity and burning furnace of divine love. You are my refuge and my sanctuary of my amiable Savior. Consume my heart with that burning fire which your heart is ever inflamed. Pour down on my soul those graces which flow from your love and let my heart be so united with yours that our wills may be one and mine in all things be conformed to yours. May your divine will be equally the standard and rule of all my desires and all my attractions. Amen. Henry Newman. He who has no need for faith, who knows the uncreated, who has cut off rebirth, who has destroyed any opportunity for good or evil, and cast away all desire, he is indeed the ultimate man. Author Gautama Buddha. When objective nature is observed, it seems to naturally surrender to flow and ascension. The hermetist allows this to occur in the subjective plane of mind and ascend naturally to higher states of consciousness. Leonardo Fibonacci studied in Egypt, Syri Syria, and Greece and would reveal this fractal nature of the universe in way of the Fibonacci sequence to general mass consciousness in 1200. This pattern of ascension can be observed on every plane of the all. We got the spiral pattern, okay? But here we see that the spiral pattern um, looks from different perspectives to illustrate the ascension and wave characteristics of the two-dimensional shape in the three-dimensional plane. So here we have a spiral, two-dimensional. On the three-dimensional plane, look at that. If we flip that up, we got this railing on the spiral staircase, which is ascending, okay? That's to represent the universe ascending because that spiral, that's what everything in the universe does. It just wants to grow. Um, the natural spirals, if squared, like seen here in the Fibonacci sequence, squared, um, creates perfect right angles. Natural phenomenon of this geometric expression is rare in the rigid sense, but can be observed in trees and plants, which in most cases have right angles relative to Earth this right angle right here and we got the Pythagorean theorem Egypt demonstrated an understanding of this sacred concept of ascension and associated it with the sun god Ra meaning new man or right ascender that RA from right angle right birthing the concept of righteous action 
um, which brings the divine will of the all into manifestation by means of physical action, neutralizing these planes of consciousness, unconscious mind, as well as the plane of subjective and objective reality for a common aspiration of unifying these fragmented or this fragmented creation we call reality. So here we can see the Fibonacci sequence apparent in the sunflower, which I put because like raw the sun. And then son of God represented in Renaissance art, a small or new man, not merely a child. So if you see here, he has an old ass face, receding hairline. He's just kind of, he's a man, you know, he's not a baby representing the new man, which when you combine left and right hemisphere, it's the neocortex at the front, which is the new brain, the latest evolved brain, which is in charge of will and righteous action when you combine your whole brain into a cohesive working part man is tree tree is man a cross section of uh the tree displays that it too originates from its center emanating outwardly seen by the rings here of growth um and each of these are for a year or two which is cool because my dad's a forester i know that <laughs> um when looked at from this perspective this perspective here the tree is constantly ascending into greater manifestation into the higher realms while simultaneously growing closer to the earth still with its ever-expanding root system so we can see here with the cliff pulp is the roots it's the kind of demonic tree of life but it's really just separation and once you climb the sephirah to the top you get you know oneness gradually so that's that uh, the tree and man share such an integral role for each other in the objective plane that they are likened to the opposite sides of the same set of lungs by Indian mystic sad guru look at this we breathe in oxygen out carbon dioxide the tree breathes in carbon dioxide out oxygen we're both integral for each other's existence one practice of meditation is to look at this reciprocal give and take in the way of observing the breath. One becomes aware of this inseparability be between the subjective and objective, like a swinging door in ancient yoga. Your exhale is the all's inhale, and your inhale is the all's exhale. These are teachings from Arshabodha, and this is my kind of general meditation that I do, and it's really effective. Here is the great year, but I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, I find no need at this time to stress the rise and fall of mankind's consciousness as a whole, because there has always existed adepts who have escaped the clutches of the lower subdivisions by having a close intimacy with the all, therefore surpassing the illusion of separation of planes and reaching a high subdivision. If we look at figures like Nietzsche, they weren't living in their current zeitgeist. They were, you know not involved with their society at the time they were thinking outside the box key to reach the seventh subdivision of spirit called overman consciousness if one resides in the zero point between objective and subjective he resides in the void that brought both into manifestation as above so below and this in a, an astrology book that i have like a woman said that this is kind of like man's evolution of consciousness through the years of how you generally as a whole man becomes more evolved and conscious and then loses it and then it's another one of those cycles here we got sixth hermetic principle cause and effect the law of cause and effect demonstrates that the word chance which means to fall like the falling of tarot cards or dice is not random but has come into manifestation through chain reactions that can be traced back to creation adhering to law. The law of cause and effect demonstrates the molecule that once comprised a mountain is, not a com is now a component of the chemical composition of your eye. In the future, a mountain's chemical composition will be comprised of your degraded eye tissue and so on. Everything occurs from an effect of previous action. And also, uh, that's karma too. Karma works on this law of cause and effect. So you have to watch what you think and say and do. If we take 
hold of the power of our inner sun or solar plexus, we can use the principle of cause and effect to manifest anything we desire. The principle states that our physical environment is a projection of our current ideals. When we change our ideals, our physical environment reflects these widened perspectives of thought and action. Physical abundance is dependent on is dependent upon an equal amount of mental abundance and righteous action. One must give to receive. Visualization and intuition contain the same concept which is grasping to the essence of our thought before language and the tendency of projecting human qualities onto it has time to occur. Thought becomes more profound the more it is allowed to remain true to its essence. So like natural law isn't anthropomorphizing everything to, to human qualities. It's adjusting our human-like attributes to nature. It's the opposite. So, seventh hermetic principle, the last hermetic principle here, we have gender. Um, in art class, we come to the conclusion that positive and negative space rely on each other for existing. Everything in life is a matter of two poles meeting, which is why everything has a gender and why we can see patterns of reproduction as a fundamental principle in all planes. This is also referred to as the law of attraction. And if we look here, it, it looks like she has hands on her face, right? But that's just negative space. There's nothing there. Both are integral for each other. Um, when the atom is observed, there is masculine active energy, which is the positive electron. And there is also its opposite manifested as the feminine or negative receptive electron that are both energy and attract each other. And this is also how, um, like, uh, what's it called? Not energy, but um, anyways, I'm, I'm moving on here. I'll come back to it. Uh, thermonuclear fusion occurs when two atoms combine to form a larger atom, creating a massive amount of energy. So here I just threw some correspondences in here. Okay. I was going to say electricity there is how is what works on that positive and negative electron dynamic too. Uh, the feminine and masculine aspects attract each other in the natural striving towards growth, observed here in the initial seed of creation. Revelation 1.8 I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who is to come, Almighty. The collision of two corpuscles to form an atom. Da Vinci's creation of Adam. So he's both hermaphroditic God and then eventually splits into the masculine and feminine aspects. Of deity creating the trinity um, alchemy meaning the holy science returns one's perception to the understanding of the all being both seemingly diametrically opposed forces at once thus reawakening the true understanding of oneness to dissolve the maya is to dissolve this imaginary barrier between the manifest and the unmanifest or subjective and objective both are integral to each other's flourishing this law remains to be true on the mental plane, creating the dual mind law or mental gender principle, the f which there's many, many archetypes that are minds, but we're just going to break it down into two today to be simple. Um, feminine pole of mind, the finite, the objective mind is receptive in nature and mentally passive. It seeks information from external sources that contain a higher vibration than it to make conclusions. This would be likened to the conscious mind. It is the workhorse of the operation, being able to decode thought forms and use them in its objective reality. The objective mind is ignorant to higher planes of vibration by nature. It relies solely on external wisdom from the more learned sources. Natural law gives the objective mind a path to follow home. So if we're always analytical and if we're always looking into other people's forms of light to follow, okay, then active principles, then uh, we'll be looking outside of ourself. The masculine pole of mind, the infinite creative, the subjective mind or active pole of mind is the mastermind of the operation and is in charge of discernment. This master of the mental has a direct link to the mastermind of the all. They are one and the same. This limitless consciousness is what the feminine mind is attracted to. 
The masculine mind does not seek validation from any source other than itself. It acknowledges itself in existing in a plane above man's lower faculties and to be the cosmic eternal essence which is possible to direct outwardly. This would be likened to the universal unconscious. Thought is the highest form of matter closest to spirit. It is the most potent and valuable resource among men. All physical intentions, or sorry, inventions that exist in our natural world were brought into manifestation from a single seed form of thought from an individual who had the ability to visualize. The process of visualization is primary to achievement. Big thinkers thought big thoughts because the mind sees all problems it is faced with as the same degree of difficulty. And if we look here, we got the four, the worlds, the four worlds, gradually the thought form coming into existence into the material. Um, it's like a secret, uh, secret formula basically to create, you know. Once one is reawakened to their masculine aspect of mind, it can be projected toward a given subject by will to reveal the subject's true nature and the key to its riddle. True concentration is achieved by exercising control and technical proficiency of the objective feminine mind to remain disciplined enough to allow the master architect's eye of the all to enlighten any realm of inquiry chosen by the objective mind. Working together, of course, um, this isn't a spotlight, Sean, to cut out the periphery to make the subject clearer. Instead, the concept is to apply all of the wisdom of the periphery onto the subject to observe it in its true light, thus unifying objective and subjective reasoning. Um, like they say that if you look at an object long enough, you'll see God in it. Um, true insight doesn't run the risk of concluding that the subject... Uh, the consciousness is concentrated upon is static or finite. Real insight perceives the object as static in truth in the subjective plane because it too belongs to the same cycle of natural law. So normally we get the feminine mind like as the creative one and stuff like that and the masculine is analytic in some forms of thinking. But here we're talking about active and passive, receptive and active. Okay, it's a little bit of a different way of looking at it. Um, purpose. Seeing many existential truths answered by natural law makes one reanalyze personal motives. This leads to purposeful living. To direct the inner light consciously is natural. In fact, it's the purpose of life. For nothing is big, nothing is small in the mind of the all, the Kabbalion. So that concludes this little presentation. It's a brief overview of these uh, principles to liberate you in knowing that you do have that inner monad, that light inside you that you can go and, and spread to the world and, and really overcome your ego. And um, once you just start to harness it and, and meditate upon it and stuff, it'll really start to grow in size until it becomes um, what drives you in life. So I guess I'll leave it there and um, I'll keep cranking out these presentations. They'll become gradually more complex. I just wanted to start off simple, get a nice little presentation out. And um, yeah, I've been studying a lot of alchemy and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think my next presentation might be on Gnosis and the Gnostic stuff, the old, old Gnostic stuff. So stay tuned for that. And uh, thanks for viewing, guys. And God bless everybody. <laughs> Peace and love.